my Harry Potter readings, then there have been four in total, so including this one. Oh, okay. So I didn't know you'd, you'd done spaces. So how do you how do you like the experience? Um, yeah, I, I enjoy it. Um, I much prefer it to say. I mean, I mean, I'm not I'm not a serial vlogger like you are, but uh, and I've not really tried it. But I much prefer it to all of those things. Yeah, because you can you can maintain some more anonymity. Yeah, and there's less to to worry about because I know with with doing live streaming, there are just so many uh, cognitive demands that that it's harder to have room in your head left for, for thinking. But mm -hmm. with the space, you can actually concentrate on your ideas and whatever you want to say without having to worry about a lot of technical issues. Yeah, I agree with you there. I mean, um, so uh, this is a recorded space. Is that okay with you? Or do you want me to start one again where it's not yes, recorded? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, because some, some people, they object to that. They're not okay with uh, there being a recorded space. Do you know what I want you, um, I wanted to ask you? Um, so uh, you had um, Mega Varma on your, um, on your podcast, right? On your live yes, stream. Yes. So w what happened then? I mean, you're not friends anymore. You're not in contact. I thought it was quite interesting how she just kind of uh, doesn't even talk about that anymore and I, and I have a feeling that she's fallen out with uh, Anna Kachian as well I don't know if you've heard of Anna Kachian Anna Kachian and Dasha both of them have a podcast called mm -hmm. uh, Red Scare oh okay I've heard of the podcast Red, mm. Red Scare I mean mm. that's, that's famous yeah um so I, I never had any friendship with with uh, what's her name Mega Mega yeah Mega let's just call her Mega well actually the, the correct pronunciation of her uh full name and surname is um Megha Verma but I think the sort of anglic anglicized pronunciation is just Mega Varma so Mega should be okay. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I never had any friendship with her. It was just I requested her to come on the show and she came on the show and that was it. And I'm, I'm so slack, I can't even find the show that, that she was on. <laughs> I mean, um, can, you not, can, you not search, can you not search for it on your blog uh, with her name? Does that yeah, I, I have, I have. I just can't find it. So That's pretty, so pretty slack of me, but yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a look for it then. I mean, I think it was a couple of years ago now, more than a couple actually. What do you think? Uh, it was when she was kind of yeah, start, starting off that... and wasn't that big on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. She's, what happened though was immediately after I interviewed her, she just disappeared. There was like some some criticism of her, and she mm. just like disappeared for for weeks. But mm. I never tried to stay in touch. I haven't had anything but the, the one off. Hey, would you like to come on my show? She came on my show, and I'm unaware of any other interaction I've had with her. Well, I think that happens to uh, women on your show. What do you think? That you have the the interactions that you have with women are generally kind of more one off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or maybe they do, uh, they I mean, do not just with women. Of, yeah. with, oh, okay. With, yeah. yeah with I mean, with other people in general. Yeah. Um, well, but then yeah. you've got that Duvid dude who keeps, you know, is a recurring... Yeah, I have some regulars, but most things are just one off. I notice, like, a lot of, like, human connection stuff is, like, a foreign language to me because mm -hmm. I didn't grow up, you know, connected to my parents. Like, I kind of grew up in foster care where mm -hmm. I had the, the, the hell beaten out of me. And so normal, normal facets of human connection and communication are, like, a foreign language to me. So I know people <laughs> often, like, connect and you know, in ways that I'm just like envious of. So I, I have to admit most, most guests on my show are pretty much one off unless mm. we happen to share like a similar sense of humor. Like right. I think what, to, to the extent that we, you and I have a connection is because we have a, a similar sense of humor. Right. And I'm, um, well, I'm glad to hear that. And I'm glad that you noticed it as well. Uh, but what about, um, what about Duvid? I mean, do you share a sense of humor there? Because Duvid is not funny to me. No, no, no. There's no sense of humor there, but there's a, there's a connection which I can't, uh, I, I can't articulate, but there is a connection there. So most people who are regulars on my show, we share a similar what I would understand is a perverse sense of humor. Um, mm. But Duvid doesn't have a sense of humor. Right. Which is, you know, it's not his fault. That's just not a language that he speaks, just like normal human connection. It's not a language um, that, that I, I speak. I mean, I don't, I don't think he lacks a, lacks a sense of humor. I mean, he's kind of passive, but I do think he can understand humor, right? If, if you are making a joke, I think Duvid does get it. It's not like a complete, you know, case of autism going on. What do you think? Um, he won't crack the uh, jokes himself, but... I don't think it doesn't seem yeah. to bring him any joy. Right. And so it's like it's like you cook a meal for someone and it's it makes absolutely no difference to them. You know, whether you cook a meal for them or you give them a glass of water. So once you have that experience, you just don't feel any incentive to cook any more meals for them. And so if you if you crack jokes or you know make fun for people, uh, you know, some people really appreciate them and then other people don't. So I'm trying to get better in my old age at recognizing which people you know appreciate my humor and which people don't. Because if people don't appreciate it, then I, I should just not do it because it's it's not really adding anything to their life. Right, yeah. Um, Z, do you want to speak? Do you want to ask uh, Luke any questions? I mean, I would be interested to know if you've heard of uh, Luke Ford before or followed any of his content. He, he, okay, he's putting a thumbs down. Um, how was your um, Sabbath yesterday? Oh, it, it's nice. It's uh, you know, It's nice to be with an in-group where you don't have to explain stuff and you can just... You know, say horrible things that you can't say in the polite world. 
Um, but what, so, what like, I really enjoy horrible things. Like, uh, <laughs> can, you, can you can you bash the gays? That's the main thing. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I still remember well, I just... you were reading out some uh, article in an Australian newspaper about how um, this guy was going around killing gays or something, and most people would be devastated. But you were just reading it out in such a humorous tone that. <laughs> Like, that's a horrible thing to do. Yeah. And, and like, I disavow whatever I did. But, like, I like to have a space where I can be horrible. I mean, yeah, but my was horrible. It, was it really horrible? Really... Um, your commentary was really good there. Yes, I disavow. <laughs> I disavow. I, I'm really opposed. It's a terrible thing. But, I mean, there are, like, all sorts of things that most people find really sad. I just find hilarious. Right. Um, so I have to be really careful about that. Like, um, like I, I know various women who, like, told me anecdotes how they just repeatedly get raped. Mm. You know, they're out there dating. Mm. And and they get into bed naked with some dude and they're like shocked that he ends up raping them. Mm. And like, this happens to, to the woman again and again and again and again. Yeah, but and they might it's be all very it dark. I mean, okay. Uh, it's, that, it's, um, sorry, go ahead. It, it's, yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's so dark, but it's also, if you put yourself in that position, like it's also very darkly, uh, this is terrible, but it's, it's very darkly funny when people, you know, repeatedly put themselves in a position to be taken advantage of, or, you know, it's not just, you know, sexually, financially, or, you know, the, the human condition is just hilarious. Like, um, the, the gays in Australia who got you know pushed over the cliff, they weren't sitting in the park reading Shakespeare. Like they were in the park having random sex with strangers, <laughs> and then you know other people came along and were not thrilled about it. Mm. So, you know, what do you think is going to happen if you're hooking up, you know, with complete randos, you know, over a cliff? You know, people <laughs> in regular society are not always like thrilled about that. Yeah. Um, no, I get where you're coming from. I, I found that episode of your um, of your kind of live stream thingy really funny. But I'm not watching your live stream so much anymore. If I can admit that here, Luke. Oh, sure. I mean, they're not for everyone. They're you know, probably not a good use of your time. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend them to anyone for whom they're not, you know, meeting the occasional need. I mean, I used um, to, I used to listen to them quite a bit, and I've got quite a few screen recordings of you that I've uploaded onto my YouTube channel. And anything that I sort of benefited from, I found really funny on your um, on your live stream. Yeah, well, like a, a little bit of forty can go a long way. <laughs> yeah, like five minutes here and five minutes there. You know, it's probably yeah, you, you know, are more than enough. You are eternally people. in my brain now, uh, and I don't have to listen to you again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you've, you've probably, you know, you've, you've had enough. It's, it's, it's good. Like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect anyone to watch the show on a regular basis. It's, it's a, like my, according to YouTube, my audience is 100% male. Right. Well, people do tell me that I'm male brain. Like, whenever they hear my voice on a space, they're like, what the hell? We thought you were a man. <laughs> and I'm like, hello. Like, okay, yeah, gazelles can be male. But generally speaking, you associate gazelles with female. So I just thought, well, why didn't you yeah. think of that? And so obviously, like, no, but you tweet like a man. <laughs> you do. I mean, you have oh. a male sense of humor. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, I've got you know, I've got a feminine side. You know, I love to talk about emotions and stuff like that. And you love to so, you love to hang, know, hang around clips as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love gossip and I love relationships and I love psychology and emotions and feelings and love wounds and love maps and you know, eroticize this and yeah. So I mean, people are complicated. Do you know who's taken? Um, well, who's given you sort of competition in my life? <laughs> Tell me. I mean. You can guess, I retweet this person a lot. I don't know if you've been on my Twitter feed for, for a while now, but like I retweet this person a lot these days. And okay, it's, it's, I'm, uh, he's, yeah. he's a comedian. He's very funny. Okay, he I'm live scrolling, stream, I'm so scrolling. But in terms of competition... Oh, I mean, Owen Benjamin. Yeah, so somebody who does live stream says that he's your competitor now in my life. <laughs> oh my God, Owen Benjamin. Man, I'm, like, he's, he's, like, he's done movies and TV. I mean, he's, he has an enormous audience. I mean, is it that he's big? Very funny. He's He is very funny, but he's obviously... he's had a bit of a change in his life now, right? That he's living on a farm, he's taking his religion very seriously. Right. Well, I, I would say you could get, get into him again. I don't know if, if you were a fan in the first place, actually, but he's, it's a new chapter of his life. He's not the same Owen anymore. What's, what's going on with him? Because it seemed like, last time I paid attention to him was like four years ago, and it seemed like he was self-destructing. So what's going on with him well, these I think, days? I think he's building back from there. I, I mean, he self-destructed in a way that nobody else did. Most people who self-destruct in that scene they kind of just uh, go towards alcohol or something, or they come back and do something really outrageous. But he um, he's rejected politics completely now. Like, he doesn't believe in the left-right divide, blah, 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 blah. So once you liberate yourself from that, then you can actually build yourself uh, in a different way. So you, you can transcend politics and turn to religion in, in a different way to most people. And how, how sane does he seem to you? I think he's very sane. It's like... For example, people probably think you are insane or you, I've, uh, absolutely. And so you've told me, absolutely. and this is public, by the way, so I'm not saying this in a kind of yeah. derogatory manner, but you know, you think that you have narcissistic personality disorder and I keep telling you, no, you don't, you don't even have it. I've said to you this, uh, I've said this to you um, via DM quite a few times, but I just don't think yeah. you have it because I think you're quite normal <laughs> in my head. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know, I enjoy having a conversation with you. Um, as, as you said, that we get each other's sense of humor. This is actually the first time we're speaking to each other, so... 
it is yeah and yeah, yet it, it feels is. like I didn't think about that yeah, yeah, yeah like we've known each other for years mm. and um so I think the same with Owen I think it's just I know people are gonna think oh this is such a cop-out but I would say society is deranged that they just don't get things anymore you speak to somebody you crack a joke you use some sort of idiomatic expression some, something of that nature like people's capacity for language is just kind of not there anymore I don't know if you sense that yeah um but I mean Owen Benjamin is brilliant mm. like I would say the guy's like 30 IQ points on me I mean he's brilliant now I think he's nuts on a lot of things or at least I did four years ago when I listened to him but you can be brilliant and, and nuts um but he is very intelligent like he's like genius level IQ and he's such a good piano player um and kind of merges that in with his comedy which is just amazing but I, I disagree with you I don't think he's that high IQ and he's admitted that in a space as well uh, in a in one of his live streams as well but he I mean I don't know what your IQ is by the way Luke so it's in the 120, so I would assume that you and I are approximately the same. Yeah, he's about 140 something. So, yeah, I mean, I'm like 120. Pretty good. Yeah. And how about you? Um, I've not had it tested. So, I mean, it's been ages. It's been almost, I'd say, 15 years since I've had it tested. And what was it then? It was. I may. It was 157 then, but I don't think I'm, I'm as clever anymore. I think it's, it's going. I think it's going to be like 70 or something. <laughs> But I, I wouldn't be surprised if you were. Like, if I found out that you were, like, 30 IQ points above me, it wouldn't be surprising to me. Hey, you can't backtrack now because you're like, oh, you're about the same as me. You're about 120. <laughs> well, I, I do, I, my guess is that you're about the same. But if you were more, I wouldn't be shocked. So there are some people who I guess are about the same as me, and I would be shocked if they were more. But you have these, these flashes where I think, wow, she's kind of operating in a different, different galaxy from me. Yeah, but you still understand that galaxy, I think. Uh, which means that we're not really... I can kind of see it, yeah. you know, with a telescope. Right. <laughs> and I think, wow, so, it'd be awesome I mean, to be uh, uh, Speaking of telescopes, um, uh, Owen Benjamin now thinks the Earth is 100% flat. I mean, well, he doesn't agree with uh, the globalists, which he defines as people who um, believe that the Earth is a globe. Okay, there's a different definition of globalism going on. Um, so, I mean, Hilarious. No, yeah, but, I but mean, some of his content is nuts. so convincing. Like, I don't know. So, do you think he's, like... What, what, do you think he's dangerous for your well-being or you just view him as entertainment? No, I don't, I don't view him as entertainment because I, I do take him seriously. I mean, he's very funny and I've got some screen recordings of him uh, on my Twitter feed and on my, uh, uploaded to my uh, YouTube account as well. Anything that I find funny of his. But I do take him seriously at the same time. I, I think that his humour reveals something about human nature that is true. Yeah. I mean, any humour that's worth anything reveals something about human nature that's true. I mean, I think that's the test for humour. Like, it's not funny if it's not true. Yeah, but um, people are always revealing different things. And sometimes those revelations are in opposition to one another. So, for example, if you... I didn't have to listen to that much George Carlin, but, like, generally speaking, he's an atheist. He, well, he's dead now, but he was an atheist. And um, so anything that he reveals about human nature, it's going to be in the direction of kind of, oh, look at them. They all are sheep for God. And so, but Owen Benjamin, on the other hand, He's saying we're all sheep for secularism, right? We're all sheep. We're all sheep. I was going to say sheep then. Well, uh, we're all sheep for um, the opposite of God. And so, yeah, but I think they're both getting at the truths. Like yeah. we all have hero systems. Yeah. So you know, my hero system is you know Torah, Orthodox Judaism. Uh, Owen Benjamin's hero system, I would assume, is you know some form of Christianity. Uh, George Harlan's hero system is atheism. But they're all getting at the eternal truth that we all have different hero systems, and we think of those who don't share our hero system as you know at best you know losers and benighted. True, but one hero system can reveal how debased humans are, and the other hu human system, uh, hero system, sorry, can reveal how, um, yeah, the opposite humans are. Right, but they're both correct. I mean, I'm incredibly base, you know, I'm incredibly horrible, mm -hmm. and I'm also incredibly, you know, moral and upstanding, you know, in different ways. Like I'm a you know, very mixed bag, mm -hmm. along with everyone else. I mean, there's, not, there's nothing special in, in that. You know, humans are, you know, potentially horrible and potentially wonderful. People are a, a mixture, right? Yeah. I mean, would you feel comfortable um, describing many of your own tendencies as horrible and many of your own tendencies as noble? Well, right now, I don't think I'm very noble. I think, um, <laughs> I think most of my tendencies I've labeled as bad. Right. But, I mean, you're incredibly gracious you know, to, to me as a, as a guest. Um, you're very polite and empathic about whether people are okay with being recorded or not. So, I mean, I would see all those things as noble. Mm. And, you know, I'm sure you do positive things for people in your life. And I'm also sure that you're, you know, a total pain in the ass at times for people in your life. Well, that's really nice of you to say, though. Um, I really appreciate the compliments there and the fact that you've noticed that about me. Um, and also the pain in the ass thing as well. That's true. Uh, <laughs> um, so, what is, sorry, what is the question now? 
or is that a question? Oh, are you like I? You know, I have a lot of self-loathing, but you know, in my in my as I grown up, you know, I don't have as much loathing for my self-loathing. So it's it's pretty easy for me to accept that I've got a lot of horrible tendencies and a lot of noble tendencies. My question for you was: Are you at ease with the reality of who you are, in that you have both these tendencies, you know, towards being horrible and towards being noble, or are you kind of ill at ease with some of that or all of that? No, I'm at ease with it because um, I feel that. Um, if I if I didn't have both of these tendencies, I wouldn't be able to understand Andrew Tate as I do. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm quite a joke there, but I think I am being serious. But uh, a lot of people they just don't understand Andrew Tate like I do. But I just get him in a way that other people don't, and that's because of my own tendencies. Um. So I I'm at ease with who I am, but um I mean. Anytime I don't feel like I'm at ease, I, I just, I'm more into blaming society now than I was before. It's ironic because people usually, they start off blaming society and then they're like, oh no, it's, it's all our fault. And you know, we've got to look in, you know, to us inside and you know, it's, it's, it's the devil inside of me. But honestly, like, I, I do think there's something wrong with society. Uh, for, for example, you asked me, well, it's interesting that we understand each other. We understand each other's sense of humor. And, and yes, yeah, so I, I, I think that's because society has changed. They just don't get somebody like Luke Ford anymore, even though he's a nice man, he's funny, uh, He's charismatic, um, and so that is society's fault. Because I don't think there's anything wrong with you, I and mean, even your little uh, label that you are, you've got NPD. I mean, I've been with people with narcissistic personality disorder, and it, it is nothing like you. Hmm. Uh, now, you say you understand Andrew Tate. Most people that I know, to the extent they think of Andrew Tate, they just think he's horrible. So are there other dimensions to Andrew Tate aside from being horrible? I just find him uh, moronic, um, you know, moronic, low-life uh, pimp. But you say you understand Andrew Tate. So what is there about Andrew Tate beyond the very cheap and easy put-downs that most people I know would have of him? Mm, I, th I think he's, he's just a sort of very experimental person that even his pimping out of women was to understand uh, what women are like. So it's not, it's, there's a kind of more, beyond the kind of uh, apparent, kind of sadistic nature of it all there is a deeper uh, experimental interest in what does it what makes a human right so you're saying that women are they, they they would just follow anything women are inherently like sheep if you do this if you do this if you do this well okay m most moral people won't do all of the things that that he's doing but he's got a point there right so i don't know i just think he's he's like it's hard to express because i've not had the opportunity to like it's all up in my head a little bit if you know what I mean. Um, but I, I mm. consider him a very empirical person. I've got to see it to believe it, right? That sort of thing. So even, even the, the kind of path to Islam, so now he's converted, that's also been quite empirical as well. So he's been looking, how do Muslims behave? Um, what is it like to, to be a Muslim? What is it like to live in, say, the UAE or Dubai or whatever? Um, and he's been watching and observing. And yeah, he's uploaded a picture of himself reading the Quran, and the Quran is placed on his groin. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that. He's li wow. lying in bed, uh, wearing his boxes. No. But the thing is, actually, um, it's not even it's not even forbidden in the religion. So all the sort of uh, critics going mad about this. I'm not. I mean, obviously, if you literally think about him putting the Quran on his dick, that is a bit weird. But the point is, he's just lying yeah. in bed reading. So, so, so I've it's not, uh, I dated. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've dated various women who are just fascinated with serial killers. And it's not unusual for serial killers to receive all sorts of mail from women, often sending alluring photos of themselves. Mm. Uh, do you resonate with that? Do you, is, it, is there a significant part of you that is kind of fascinated with bad boys? No, I'm not fascinated by bad boys. Also, I find Andrew Tate very handsome. So that might be something to do with it. Like if he was just a minger, like I don't know if you say minger is in, uh, you're from Australia, aren't you? Yeah, I, I yeah, yeah. I thought we say minger yeah. here in the UK. <laughs> Maybe it was just yeah. this minging sort of, ooh, I'm a pimp. He's got nothing uh, physically appealing about him. Uh, he doesn't have any kind of charm. But then I would not have any interest in him whatsoever. Like even if he was going around killing everybody and making huge loads of money, um, I, I would not have any interest. I would just think yuck. Like, have you ever have you ever sent a letter to a serial killer? No. Okay, I was just curious. <laughs> it's just kind of, it's kind of a weird part of the, I, the male female. I don't, I don't I don't think of him as a serial killer either. I I think of him. I see a light in him. Again, uh, so as you are, mm -hmm. are you asking, what do you see in him that others don't? I, I see a kind of uh, innocence in him, ironically. Like, even after doing all of these things, I mean, he's not killing people, right? He's just engaged in this uh, sex work industry and he's, he's a pimp. But, you know, there's, 
he's honest about it, right? So there is transparency there that you don't see with other people. But again, that transparency might be there because he's hiding something even worse, right? So, yeah. Do you have any kind of, fascin to the extent that you can say this publicly, do you have any kind of uh, fascination with the sex industry? Um, what is the sex industry? So are you talking about uh, porn? Are you talking about... Um... Well, Andrew Tate and I have something in common in that you know, I wrote about the, the sex industry, the porn industry for a decade or so. Um, Andrew Tate is, you know, uh, accused at least of pimping women. And uh, so I was just curious if if the the darkness of, of the flesh industry is um, is fascinating to you. Um, it is a little bit fascinating to me. But then again, I've not um, I've not actually read your book. So that, that is ironic as well. That if I if I was <laughs> fascinated enough, I would go right. and read it. Uh, but then I have I have watched the, the kind of mini documentary on you and uh, your past life, and um, you sort of video it and your own your own production um, where you're kind of videoing random women in the past and things like that. So I found that interesting. But um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, like for example, Eric Weinstein. Is it Weinstein or Weinstein? I, I believe the proper is Weinstein, though I don't often say the proper pronunciation. Okay, well, I'll stick to Weinstein because I've heard Owen Benjamin call him Eric Weinstein recently. So uh, Eric Weinstein got some interview with Riley Reid, who is this famous uh, pornographic actress. And it's like, I wasn't interested one bit to watch that. I, I mean, maybe I would have been interested like 10 years ago when sex was more of a fascination mm -hmm. to me, especially coming from a Muslim background. But I, I really didn't care for what she had to say because I watched some of those Eric Weinstein um, podcasts. I think the podcast was called The Portal or something like that. And I, I, mm -hmm. I listened to his stuff with uh, Sam Harris and I was quite attentive to a few of those podcasts. But, you know, when it came to Riley Reid, again, like, there is an irony there because I I would, I mean, I would reply in the affirmative that I do have a bit of a fascination with those things. But the irony is that it just isn't that big a fascination for me to sit there and watch these people with that great of an interest. And what's your fascination with Harry Potter? Oh, it's, uh, there is no fascination, actually. I really hate Harry Potter. J.K., well, I don't, I don't really hate Harry Potter, that's not true. Um, I'm not really a fan, like a lot of people are. J.K. Rowling is an interesting character to me. So I have, uh, yeah, I'll accept you in a second, Ace. I'll just finish my point about um, J.K. Rowling. Uh, Ace wants to speak Luke, so it'll be interesting what he has to say. Um, yes. So, yeah, J.K. Rowling, she is an interesting character to me because she is heading this kind of, um, this kind of uh, pro-turf uh, lobby, right? I don't yes. know if you've noticed, like, but in the mainstream media kind of echo chamber, she is the one who's the face of, of the turfs, and she's really like, oh, I hate you know trans toilets. We're really worried about trans toilets, and is always tweeting these sorts of things. But then J.K. Rowling, she, her crime fiction pen name, her pseudonym is Robert Galbraith. So she's fucking uh, writing as a man herself. So there is a kind of weird thing going on here. I feel that her. Yeah, it just. I'll just finish that. I feel that her fixation on the trans issue is disingenuous and there is a psychoanalytic framework that can be employed here like there is a level of projection going on which is unexplored to me at least yeah yeah I, it just struck me that another thing we have in common is that we think the most social political cultural commentary is really stupid and we kind of laugh at it yeah oh, definitely and i don't think we always trust <laughs> the apparent i'm just gonna leave and come back because i can't hear ace if you guys just say i'm just coming yeah how's it going ace hey can you guys hear me i can hear you and i'm sure curious what we have to hear you in a minute so uh what's what's on your mind today ace well uh i'm just very surprised that this space is happening luke ford because i uh there was one specific video where you had a bunch of people on that uh made an impact on me and so uh, it's very cool to see you in here on twitter a lot of uh the people that have been through some of the right wing circles usually don't do spaces so i, I just think it's pretty cool but um i was curious with with your background how you kind of got your show into some of these right wing circles because uh, i i don't know you too well again i haven't seen too many uh of your videos but uh, you, you did seem to be one of the few people that <laughs> that like got out of that uh, kind of alt-right scene without any. Uh... Sure, sure. Yeah, um, I'm sorry to say I did not. Uh, I, I wasn't tuning into your show regularly, but I thought you kind of had this this uh, niche where you were basically like the Johnny Carson of the alt-right, if you don't mind me <laughs> saying that. Um, yeah, no, I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah. And so um, I was just curious, like what 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 fascinated you about enough to invite a lot of these these types of people on people that would go on to kind of blow up in the news people like fuentes and all these other personalities that were kind of cutting their teeth on uh, things like your show so i was just curious what, what attracted you to it i think as i understand it um i'm i'm a bachelor i've never been married i don't have kids and i think you'll see with people who don't have children of their own that they they tend to chase excitement and so i've chased excitement into some you know pretty dark places but the one of the places i, I chased excitement was into the alt-right it was 
it was just weird and exciting to talk to these people with, you know, these uh, socially disreputable, you know, supposedly the most evil people around. Like it's exciting to talk to, you know, supposedly really evil people, whether they're in the, the pornography industry or you know some kind of, you know, ethnic or racial nationalism. Um, yeah, I guess excitement is kind of the, the common core to many of the topics that I talk about or, you know, invite people on. So I think that's the, the uniting factor. You know, I'm, I'm just a, another you know, adrenaline junkie bachelor. Interesting. Wow. OK, because um, there's a lot of people kind of in the aftermath of uh, I mean, I guess we could say after 2017, that was um, kind of the post era. But a lot of people have tried to make sense of it, obviously. You know, you're effectively kind of um, I think I, I think I was basically the gist of it was um, you kind of came onto the scene as a rather than like a rather than like a leader, quote unquote, leader figure. You were uh, kind of interviewing a lot of. Pe- oh, that's what it was. There's a lot of people after after 2017 that have effectively tried to uh, do your job, Mr. Ford. They've uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're aware there's a lot of journalists that have uh, their own take on all of the, the people you bring on your show. But more recently, I'd say in the last year, there's been a lot of like genuine curiosity with a lot of online discourse and it kind of resembles your show in the sense of trying to create this uh free speech space on the internet where we're trying to define all these different types of uh, personalities and i was curious if you've noticed some of that uh on your on your timeline some of the uh online journalism so to speak that uh that i think people like you were kind of ahead of the curve on um yeah i've noticed a bit but things are a lot more complicated once the alt-right started slaughtering people so when i was doing it the alt-right wasn't really slaughtering people and then there was an explosion of you know, alt-right massacres. And that makes the conversations more difficult and more challenging and more charged, more scary, more dangerous. So I I think the, like the Christchurch massacres, the mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, the massacre at the Walmart in, I think, El Paso, Texas, uh, the massacre at the supermarket in Buffalo, the two different attacks on synagogues, one in Pittsburgh, one in San Diego, these things. um, And then in my own neighborhood on successive days, Orthodox Jews were shot, you know, walking out of synagogue. So these things have made, you know, talking to the alt-right more, more difficult and dangerous. Now, would you say we're still in that climate? Yeah, I mean, at least in the normie world. Like, it used to be that the alt-right was primarily known as a bunch of merry pranksters. But then, starting with Richard Spencer's Hailgate in the end of 2016, you know, the alt-right, to the extent that people know about it at all. Sorry, I got inter- interrupted, but, but, You're good. but now the, you know, the alt-right is regarded as murderous. And so that makes conversations more difficult. Yeah, but um, the early members of the alt-right, they used to sleep with trannies. If you remember Thurnimits.com, uh, his old blog post where <laughs> <laughs> he, he, um, he's sort of uh, admitting to, well, not even admitting, he's, he's recommending uh, sleeping with a tranny and how to do it. Uh, so that is just absolutely bizarre. Um, I don't know, for, for me, the, the origin of the alt-right it lies with individuals like Cernovich. Like, obviously, that's probably not true. But in my head, my mental association is like Cernovich and these sorts of people. And then Richard Spencer comes in afterwards for me. Yeah, so most people are far more upset by massacres than sleeping with trannies. So I think the whole mass slaughter of people um, really put a, a damper on uh, conversations with the alt-right. Uh, would, you, would you say that was a fair distinction between before Hailgate it really was like a big tent movement. Some people minimize that and say that wasn't the real alt-right. But w- would you say that's that's genuine, that you had a bunch of kind of like libertarian slash anti-war people that were not super political, but you could accurately describe them as alt-right? Yeah, I mean, it was more big tent. It was more amorphous. And you had a lot of you know respectable people who were happy to associate with the alt-right. I mean, Steve Bannon called the, the Breitbart website alt-right. So after Hailgate, though, nobody with anything to lose could associate with the alt-right because Richard Spencer deliberately insisted essentially that uh, to be alt-right is to be a Nazi and therefore anyone with you know any kind of professional educational social communal standing could not have anything to do with the alt-right and so it just got overtaken then by antisocial losers who had an unfortunate habit of murdering people and constantly falling out with each other and it just became you know a crap show. Now um, do you see it's very funny like people like Spencer have obviously uh, had a very interesting arc in recent uh, in recent months but uh People that sort of uh, write about these people now, maybe not lefty journalist types, but uh, some of these more tw- like t- online Twitter people that try to create like a genealogy of all the, you know, there's some people who say that there's a difference between somebody who, like, I think you mentioned the, um, the te- or not Texas, uh, this, this Hispanic person that identified with these far right symbols, even though he was non-white himself. Some people try to look at that and rather than uh, do the usual hit piece, they'll say things like, well, it's it's complicated because people on the right are attracted to different things. And so we, we would not call this person like a white supremacist. We would just say, you know, this is like a mental illness case, or this is, uh, you know, some, someone who got wrapped up in online stuff, et cetera. Do you see like there is kind of now, or maybe you would disagree with this now, it seems like there's not a lot of 
pressure from like Right Wing Watch, for example, to uh, put out consistent hit pieces on the latest young up and coming far right personality. And uh, it does seem like there is some uh, curiosity into, you know, what is the psychology behind a lot of these people? Yeah, I think the alt-right is pretty much dead. Uh, George Hawley is a political science professor who wrote two books on the alt-right. And after he gave a speech at UC Berkeley in something like May of 2018 or 2019, he, he had no more speeches booked. Nobody else was, was curious about the alt-right. Now, there are gradations to the alt-right, like there are gradations to uh, sex workers and strippers and pornographers. So if you go to a strip club, you'll find that the girls are often quite catty you know, about you know, other girls that like one girl might spread more, show more, reveal more than the other girls. And so the, the regular girls think she's a slut. Um, and I'm sure if you go to a sewer, you know, there are various you know, forms of sewage in a sewer and you know, some are you know, probably more deadly than others. And then in the pornography industry, you know, certain people look down on other pornographers, they're not real pornographers or they're, you know, they're you know, false to the medium or whatever. So there are always gradations in the human condition, but for Philippe Paul in polite society, they have no interest in you know, social interactions with sex workers in general. Like nobody wants to bring a hawker home to meet his mother and people in polite society understandably have no interest except a prurient interest in uh, alt-right personalities anymore. While prior to Trump's election, there was something often you know, funny or entertaining or compelling. But once the alt-right got associated with slaughtering people, uh, it ceased to be funny. Now, I know that um, someone like Spencer, who advocates for the banning of 4chan, because it creates uh, the situation you're talking about, where it, it basically people get radicalized online and then it looks like violence is their only uh, thing to do afterwards. Um, and he's been very critical of this arc. I think this has made him very uh, pessimistic of a lot of anonymity on, t on Twitter, the internet in general, is the idea that you don't really have authentic conversations. You allow all the trolls. Yet you mentioned earlier the pranksters. Do you think even somebody who uh, kind of makes the whole movement look bad or someone who does something like a shooting, would we still label them as alt-rights, even if uh, a lot of people would like to distance themselves from like that specific activity? Well, for, for right now, I mean, the alt-right is just considered, you know, a murderous bunch of Nazis and it, it cannot be you know, reclaimed in, you know, the next 10 years. I mean, it is, it is dead and dusted. Uh, now, Richard Spencer's, you know, interesting because when the trolls were on his side, he was all on board with anonymous trolling. But when the trolls turned against him, he turned against the trolls. So Richard Spencer was all for free speech, free expression, you know, anonymous trolling when he felt like he was leading them, when he was the leader, when he was showing the way, when they, when he felt like they were doing what he wanted. But then when they went against him, then he suddenly became much more, you know, hostile towards free speech, free expression and, and trolling. So, I mean, we're all profoundly influenced by whatever's in our own personal interest. And usually the more you have to lose, the more you probably want to restrict speech. Now, after the serious strike in, I think that was early 2017, you had a lot of people in the alt-right disavow Trump and say, this isn't what we signed up for. We thought that there was going to be a paradigm shift and it looks like Trump is a regular Republican. And so, you know, people jump ship. Do you think the, the fact that someone like Spencer was uh, used to be supportive of anonymity and now he's not, is is that like a misunderstanding of like of what the Trump movement was supposed to be, which was people thinking outside the box, people actually looking for alternative perspectives on politics. But then it became literally like the GOP plus Trump, you know, baby boomers plus Trump in the sense of there really is no vision outside of Trump. It's kind of this cult of personality. And maybe maybe what people were expecting after 2016 was people like uh, Andrew Anglin or all these other characters were not going to define the movement. It was going to be these smart kind of uh, aristocratic type figures. But but that didn't really happen. All we got was uh you know, people that were MAGA Republicans and then some, uh, like you said, some of these prankster types. Uh, do you see that as kind of one of the flaws of the alt-right is that the, the movement would like to see itself as something that was very aristocratic, but it was really mostly just a lot of trolling. Well, would that be accurate to say? Uh, maybe. Like uh, prior to 2016, the alt-right was primarily a spoken word movement. And so it was much higher IQ. Then after 2016, 2017, it became primarily a podcasting and live streaming movement, which was much more accessible to people with lower intelligence. So the intelligence level of the alt-right dramatically dropped. But I, I think most people... Uh, adopt or discard ideologies and uh, religions and, and friends and spouses and communities, you know, based on whether it's still serving them. So, you know, some guys fall in love with, you know, a woman and then after they get married, like the, the intensity of the sex dies and they find her a drag and they no longer, you know, feel like she's meeting his needs. And so he dumps her or a woman falls for a man and she thinks he'll keep her safe and protected and be, she'll be provided for. But then she finds out, you know, he's a scam artist and, you know, unreliable. And so she, you know, runs away. So, so too with like a church, you know, or a synagogue or a political movement, like people adopt these things when they feel like it's serving them. And then they run away when it's no longer serving them. So when the alt-right was something that was funny and edgy and provided, you know, entertainment and value, and it seemed aesthetically cool, you know, a lot of people were into it. But as soon as it became associated with, with mass murder, then, you know, people who have any sense, you know, just flee from it. And, and so too with Trump, when, when embracing Trump, you know, meant something positive in your social world, you know, you're incentivized to embrace Trump. 
uh, when embracing Trump means that you're a moron, according to the people that you most want to be close to, then you're going to be incentivized to, to drop Trump. So I think that the difference between the 2016 and 2020 election was there was a 2% swing against Trump in the suburbs in both 2018 and 2020. So a lot of like people who are middle, middle of the road politically, about you know, 2% of the, the suburban electorate you know, turned against Trump. So, I mean, people will adopt a church, a religion, uh, gurus, a, a yoga studio, uh, fashion, um, you know, books, uh, podcasts, you know, based on how it makes them feel and how it serves them. And what serves you and makes you feel special, you know, one day, you know, the next day it just doesn't do it for you anymore. Like, you know, someone might find me funny and insightful and entertaining one day. And then the next day they realize that, you know, Owen Benjamin's, you know, far funnier and more insightful. And so, you know, you move on. And so people move on, was, particularly in America. very funny of you, Luke Ford, to <laughs> mention that. <laughs> but it's true. Like, we don't want people to be down these. To Luke Ford. I'm going to have to switch back to Luke Ford live streams. <laughs> But, but did you agree with the basic idea? We're all looking for stuff that meets our needs and, you know, fashion or religion or, you know, friends. Yeah. You know, we, we move in and out of these things depending on whether they're meeting our needs or not. Yeah, I, I think it's funny. A lot of people mention the uh, the Canadian influence on the, the far right. You know, you got people like Gavin McInnes and Lauren Southern and all Blaze TV types. You know, it's funny how much of the movement was... Uh, was made up of people not technically American, but the way that it fizzled out seemed very American. This kind of like democracy gone bad experiment where uh, the, the the supporters, like you said, they're eating their own. They're kind of uh, going after themselves rather than uh, the people they disagree with politically. And uh, but I don't know. I, I don't know if it could have ended any other way, because it does seem like you said it was kind of like a recipe for disaster. Um, I don't I don't know if uh, a lot of people just understood how to manage an online movement, because it is such a I mean, in America, dissident movements don't succeed, period. You know, I don't know if a lot, I mean, unless we were I think stuff right. on the left. Yeah, I think you're right. What, what, and, what doomed the old right is what doomed every other previous white nationalist movement. And that is the very low quality of the people who are subscribing to, to the movement. And in the final analysis, the people who yeah. are pro-alt-right were a bunch of socially marginalized losers, you know, high school dropouts, you know, meth addicts, um, you know, freaks, deviants, you know, antisocial types who couldn't, you know, maintain relationships, you know, felons, you know, criminally inclined, you know, just a lot of bad, moronic people. And I remember that this live stream that I did that attracted the biggest audience was uh, what's colloquially known as the Saturday Night Jim Goad Massacre. And that's where I had Nick Fuentes, and, you know, <laughs> Baked Alaska, and Jim Goad, and the, the Irony Bros. That's, and, and many people just that's found right. it tremendously entertaining. But it was such a headache to deal with the repercussions of that. It, it ended my friendship with Jim Goad. And I never again wanted to do a stream <laughs> like that because it, it attracted a lot of antisocial types. So I've become like hyper focused on kind of narrow casting ever since then, because I saw how easy it was to just bring in a, a rush of, you know, antisocial people into my life through, through a live stream. And I, I didn't want that. So I, like I instituted a code of conduct for how people should behave. Um, I 95% of people who want to come on my show, I won't let them on my show because, you know, they're antisocial and self-destructive and it just brings a lot of havoc in its midst. So I think with the, with the alt-right and any political, social, cultural uh, movement, live stream, podcast, you have to be really careful what type of people you attract because you start bringing in losers and it'll just blow everything up. Uh, now, to be fair, I, I, from what I understand, there was a lot of difficulty getting Jim Goat's friend to join the stream, and that was a consistent. <laughs> why, why you? There was a lot of moments like that. Which... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was a very, uh, very memorable moment among others. But, uh, but yeah, I, that was the stream I was referencing earlier. I, I did not know exactly what it was called, but I remember it being very memorable, and I did not realize it was the same one because, uh, yeah, that was uh, a lot of a lot of different worlds colliding onto one stream, which is very rare, and especially today. A lot of those people are banned from mainstream platforms. So you really had access to a, a pivotal moment, a rare moment in the internet history. <laughs> but um, Gazelle, you can uh, take the floor. Yeah, Ace, uh, I know you could talk about Richard Spencer for another 48 hours, but... Um... <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> very very hard not to do, I apologize. Can I just point the listeners and the host to this uh, photo of um, uh, Alex Soros? You can see this, yes. Um, but you need to zoom into Alex Soros' feet. I want you to do that. Um, I don't know if I want no, no, to do no, that. No, no, seriously, guys, I want you to do that now. Uh, Mr. Ford, please do that. Alex Soros' feet. And just <laughs> look at his left. You're, 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 not, you're not impressed by the, the lack of grooming. <laughs> no, I, I understand. This is a... Uh... It is controversial. And so, uh, in, a, in about ten minutes, friend. in about ten minutes here, I'm, I'm very tempted to just leave the phone on and let Gazelle do the uh, Gazelle show. Where, where do you need to go? Uh, I need to go with my parents somewhere, but I I will be back. I, I'd imagine Gazelle could uh you know fill fill a concert hall of words in my absence, but um yeah that's I, just something I'm, I'm thinking out loud about, here. Uh, Alex Soros' feet uh for forty eight hours. You could do that, Spencer, as you would do. I I would much rather uh. You would rather stare at Richard Spencer's feet, right? <laughs> No, 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 that's not, I wasn't trying to imply something like that, but um, I, uh, I, I was, I, I guess final, final thing I'll say since I'm about to pop off, but uh, for Mr. Ford, I was curious what your, what your thoughts are on, on his current arc right now, besides what you've said earlier, this, uh, this very uh, romantic arc I think he's going on right now. Yeah, so I'm always looking for the, the through line, and what seems to be the through line with every single thing that Richard Spencer says and does is pay maximum amount of attention to me. So wherever he goes, I mean, I think I recognize that because I recognize it in myself. Like I've often had the impulse in social interactions to how can I maximize the attention given to me right now? And that seems to be the animating force behind whatever Richard does. 
Now, tell me if I'm being a little too charitable here, but, you know, for, for myself personally, I've become a lot less political. Gazelle has uh, taken me to the woodshed with this kind of rhetoric. And uh, I've been trying to liberate myself fully from left, right type talk. And uh, I know that that's a little that's a little uh, hard to do. But I was curious because, you know, a lot of the problems with the alt right is, like you said, there were a lot of unexceptional people that were trying to cling to like these philosophies and literary styles that were outside their their IQ level, frankly. But somebody who is college educated wants to go beyond politics, kind of like what the left does with wokeism. Wouldn't the natural thing to do after 2017, after the alt-right dissolves, is to kind of do this artsy thing where you're not strictly talking about politics or talking about the news, but uh, doing some type of project that is romantic in nature, kind of, uh, I mean, not like writing books, but like doing like public theater, doing performance art, something to that effect, which has all of these philosophical underpinnings. Um, wouldn't that be the more practical way to apply something like the alt right, which was a political movement. But after seeing it fail, what, aren't you just supposed to go into the art world after that, since uh, the politics just didn't seem to shape out? Well, yeah, I mean, Richard doesn't want to pay the price for saying what he really thinks. So he is moving on to an abstract Atsi, uh thing of creating a new religion. I mean, he still basically has the same impulses as he did three, five, ten years ago, but he doesn't want to pay that price. So he's, yeah, he's going the, the artsy religion, spiritual revival route. And if, it, But if it became socially acceptable to talk about what he really wants to talk about, he'll, he'll do that. But you know, he's going to adjust himself to the to the situation whereby he can still get the maximum of attention, um, but without the headaches that came with uh, his previous incarnation. And, and maybe the last thing I'll say before I put the phone down, maybe American politics in the f near future is going to resemble something that's a little less. You guys were talking about the Red Scare podcast earlier. Honestly, I know it's controversial to say I do kind of see something like that, this kind of cynical, anti-political approach to be the, the future of American politics, kind of less D.C. heavy and more uh, more CBGBs here, more, uh, more of a, uh, Andy Warhol. You, you have mischaracterized that as Red Scare when it's actually Fordian, I would say. Mm. Would you say yeah, so? Yeah, I think for, for Fordianism, Fordism is the way forward for American politics. I truly believe this. <laughs> I, I, I would be open to that, you know. And, and Mr. Ford, you're someone that has not a D.C., you know, this... Uh, this kind of uppity, yuppie, Patrick Bateman background, you know, well, maybe Patrick Bateman in other ways, but you don't really have this Wall Street disposition. You, you have something that is outside of politics, and then you kind of got into politics. To me, that's the ultimate way to do it, is to come out of another industry and go into politics, not to be groomed for power, this like Sean Hannity archetype. Um, a lot of people tell me things like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's not professional. That's not how you do American politics. But I don't know. It's, it just seems to follow through with people like Trump, people who become very sensational in the media. I think people like that artsy approach. But all the examples we have recently are these failures, you know, these these uh, alcoholics, uh, among other things, and all these degenerate types. Um, so I think it's just a matter of trying to uh, revive the Roman Empire without the Caligula arc. I, I don't know if it's possible. Maybe futile. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think higher IQ people are not satisfied with the level of discourse that they find in the, the, the mainstream media. And, and and a more intelligent discourse you know, realizes our own uh, vulnerabilities to constantly changing situations. So that what we stand for today, you know, tomorrow in a different situation would be absolutely catastrophic. And so I think a more nuanced, sophisticated and, and humble approach, uh, you know, probably will have more resonance with you know, more thoughtful, perceptive and higher IQ types. So do you, do you think um, me and Ace are the, uh, are the future of podcasting? Yes. Yes. You, you guys are definitely the future. <laughs> Let's go. Um, um, before, before Ace uh, leaves, um, I just wanted to ask Luke, yes. um, do, you, do you know uh, anything about um, Thomas 777? Seven, seven? Seven? Nothing. Seven, Nothing. Luke Ford, I have I have a plethora of uh, documents to send your way. I'll put them on your desk, and um, I'd be curious. I think I think you would have a field day with this uh, case study subject. Okay. Um, we're talking about we're talking about the future here. I think uh, this person is ripe for uh, potential. So, um, we we, we kind of have a different generational so perspective. What is given the, the what is the triple seven in, in Thomas's name? From what I understand, yeah. I think it's a play on not triple six, which is evil. Triple seven is a seven is a a more respectable number, a less disreputable number, and so oh, it's kind of turning. I think it's a play on on. Um... 007. I thought like. Ah, yeah. Well, there maybe. <laughs> I, I understand he likes Timothy Dalton. I think that's his favorite Bond, and uh, Roger Moore is some uh, some loser. I think by his standards. Oh, I really so like maybe that's. Moore. And I think I think mm. Thomas Seven 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 is a loser. <laughs> this is uh, this is very disrespectful. I know you're in love with him. I am. All right. It's uh, I'm in love with a lot of uh, people, a lot of uh, people we've mentioned in the past. Um, from a scholarly perspective, of course, teacher student, professional teacher student relationship. And, uh, I mean, Luke, what do you think about this picture of Ace uh, with uh, Thomas Triple Seven in the Jumbotron? And uh, be as honest as you can. I, I appreciate any feedback. Um, okay, let's have a look here. Um, okay, I'm not. Oh, sorry. Um, there it is on my phone. I don't know how to manipulate all this. I don't really have. Um, I'm not as aesthetically. I'm more oral, A U R A L, than um, I am visual. So I don't really have strong feelings about pictures. 
Um, I mean, you, you could look at the comments. Um, <laughs> you don't have to do that, Mr. Ford. Some, somebody asked me, so what ethnicity are you? And I replied, Latina. <laughs> Sorry. A, a very, a very, not, not only highlighting the ethnic ambiguity, but also implying that I'm a woman, which is, you know, kind of a double homicide there. Is, but I, uh, I, was, I did catch I that. Thank you, Gazelle. If he eats uh, enough protein, but he's only has one meal a day. But if he eats enough protein and he gets enough fat and he gets all the nutrients and he goes to the gym, I think he could look like a heartthrob. I think he could look like Andrew Tate, to be honest. Well, Gazelle, we were doing this thought experiment months back, but if I were to do all those things that you're saying, are you saying that I could hypothetically date a Kate Beckinsale type? Was that the implication? No, the implication was that Thomas Triple Seven will be attracted to even more. <laughs> <laughs> Gazelle. Gazelle, this is my space, I, I must remind you, but... um, Yeah, well, you've given me uh, I... charge of this space now anyway, so off you go. You have, you have. <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm about to bow out, but um, hopefully I can hear your voices as I come through the front door in about an hour. <laughs> but um, uh, Mr. Ford, it's thank you so you're much. Welcome. I appreciate it. I did not expect to... Waking up this morning, I did not expect to uh, be talking to the Luke Ford, so I, I appreciate the uh, the insights, well, the lore. Nor did I. My Harry Potter space was basically derailed. Um, and That's and true. Z, um, so there's an account uh, who goes by the name of Z, who's usually in those Harry Potter spaces, all those reading spaces. He left the space because he thought that we were going down the uh, anti-Semitism lane, which usually happens in spaces. Because I asked Luke, um, Mr. Ford, oh, well, how, how was Sabbath yesterday? And, and Z thought that I was being, you know, I was, we were going to talk about some Jew stuff. But it was, it was a genuine question because Luke Ford is Jewish. <laughs> And so Z left immediately, if you, if you, if you can recall, <clears throat> from that space. I think Ace is uh, gone now. Um, so, what do you want to talk about, uh, Mr. Ford? Are you going to be here for, for, for a while? or are you um, I, or... I probably won't be here that long, but are you, are you reading any good books lately? Um, so, we were doing Harry Potter. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna, but I meant good I'm books. Gonna, uh, yeah. uh, no, I'm, I've not been uh, reading anything, really. Actually, um, I've been reading the Quran, so that has been keeping me busy. And, and has the internet affected your, um, uh, what was it called, attention space? Uh, you know, is, is like reading a book kind of a downer compared to the simulation of the internet? Uh, 100%. Um, I cannot read anymore. <laughs> Full stop. But that, that also has something to do with uh, a really traumatic past relationship. So yeah. is that coupled with, um, with the internet and all of this kind of constant uh, stimulus that you're getting online so all of that mixed together has, has resulted in an inability to just read to myself which is why part of the reason I'm doing the um, the reading spaces even if no one's really there or listening it's it's just to get myself into reading again it's a bit selfish and how how is hosting these spaces how is and participating in spaces how has that affected you how has that changed you if at all it's made me more aloof <laughs> <laughs> <Like people. laughs> uh, I mean, um, my family, so I live with my family and they uh, think I've gone bonkers. Um, they're like, well, we speak uh, Urdu at home. And my, my sisters are like, why are you always speaking in a British accent in your room? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's because I'm, I'm doing Twitter spaces. And then my mom's like, oh, what is a Twitter space? And, um, you know, any attempt to explain what it is, it just you know, goes over her head. Because she, she, she refuses to understand what this thing is about. She just thinks it's absolutely bizarre. And what about the singing? Are you doing much singing these days? No, not really. Um, I mean, I was uh, kind of derailing uh, spaces uh, in the beginning by just randomly singing in them, kind of trolling people. You know, when people are just going on and on and on and they're kind of like talking to themselves, maybe like, I don't know if you've heard Athenian stranger in spaces. It's like monologue after monologue after monologue and it keeps going and going and going and going. And then sometimes I just felt the need to just start singing. Uh, but people then told me that, um, Gazelle, you can't sing, so don't, don't do it again. So that, that has had a kind of, pretty negative effect on my um, confidence when it comes to singing. Is there, is there any song you'd like to sing right now? Um, no, not, not really. I, also, people are asleep in the house, so it would be a bit weird to start <laughs> singing. <laughs> um, how about you? Can you sing at all, uh, Mr. Ford? Not, good voice on you. Not, not very well, but I, I do do voice exercises several times a week, just mainly for my speaking voice. Uh, mm. So I, I'm interested in the voice, but I, I was always mocked for having a really bad singing voice when I was a kid. And so I'm probably still um, gun shy. <laughs> I think that that proves your heterosexuality, because honestly, my uh, threshold for what makes a gay man is very, very low now. Like if a guy starts singing or, you know, they can they can even just do a bit of do, re, mi, fa, sol, latido uh, in tune. I will just be like, OK, same guy who uh, created Succession, which is a huge uh, cultural elite uh, hit show in the States. Is that, um, how old is that? Succession, it just ended about a month ago. Mm. And the uh, Peep Show and went so from we... like 2003 to 2009. And that's British, are you saying? Or it's not? It's yeah, yeah, Jesse Armstrong made the uh, Peep Show 
and he also created Succession. So he did Peep Show, Fresh Meat, which is about you know uh, people at uni uh, in the Loop, uh, which was a movie. He did Four Lions, and um, oh, did you uh, did you enjoy Four Lions? By the way, I did. I did. I, I didn't find it that funny. Maybe yeah, I've well, grown up around people like that, so it's just like, <laughs> oh, I've had enough of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't grow up around people like that, so for me, it's all mm. bizarre and funny. Right. Yeah. Um, did you watch um, Little Britain, that uh, comedy show no. that used to be on the BBC? Oh, God, it was, it was so funny. Um, but it's been cancelled now, like it's been taken off BBC iPlayer, so because some of the stuff was a bit racist and sort of oh. you know, out there. <laughs> yeah, but you should some watch real the British stuff. Sorry? Mm, you, should watch the, you should watch the Mirror sketch from Little Britain. Um, oh, okay. It's so funny. Um, I mean, I just die laughing when I'm watching that. On YouTube, I'll send you a link. Um, anything else you want to um, discuss? No, I'm pretty good. Go I, should probably, I should probably get on with it, but uh, it's great to you know, finally hear your voice. Oh, I know. It's been lovely talking to you. And uh, are you live streaming tonight? or? No, I think I'm pretty much done for the day. I'm going to start to wind down. So I was, I've was i been waking up at like 3 or 4 a.m. these days, so it's now uh, 6.30 p.m. here. I'm going to start to start to chill and wind down for the day. So what time do you sleep then these days? Um, I usually go to bed between 8 and 10 p.m., and I usually wake up between three, four, occasionally I get to sleep until like 5 a.m. Wow, that's a really good routine. It's not by choice. Like I'd love to just sleep until 5 a.m., but I'm just, I keep waking up at like two or 3 a.m., like absolutely wired that I want to make notes on this or I want to blog on that. And you know, I'm just like mm. so consumed by an idea or a thought or you know, something that I think might be funny that uh, it's useless to stay in bed. But you know, I wish I was more normal. Well, I think what you're doing would have been normal uh, just you know, a couple of decades ago. It's, again, I'm blaming society once again. <laughs> Okay, to be continued. Um, this was fun. No, I, I just had one more question, which is how yes. often do you live stream now? Um, it daily? varies. So sometimes I'll go a week, 10 days without doing anything. And then sometimes I'll do a stream every day for six days. I'd probably say on average two or three times a week. But it may just be for an hour at a time. So how can less do. now? Um, because I'm, I'm making more money. And I've got like oh, more okay. good things in my life. And so I have less need for whatever live streaming fills. But today I live stream for four hours because... I knew that I'd have to do some deep carpet cleaning as soon as I stopped live streaming. So I tried to mm. push the live streaming as long as possible because I really didn't want to do the carpet cleaning. But then I thought, you know, maybe if I take this woman out to dinner and give her a kiss and a cuddle, maybe she'll do the carpet cleaning for me. So I'm going to try to be like um, Andrew Tate. Oh, okay. So you are now actively pursuing women, is it? Well, I, I don't like doing the carpet cleaning. You know, I need to be focusing on the big ideas. Does this mean you're looking for a wife? Uh, I, I, I guess. I don't want to do my own carpet cleaning. So, okay. yes, I well, get wife. <laughs> I wish you the best of luck. And I hope you find a carpet cleaner very soon. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Enjoy the rest of your night. Okay. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.